I'm Sandy Knapp and I'm the current president of the Linnaean Society and I'd like to, to welcome you to this to this lunchtime lecture. Um, and our lunchtime lectures uh, were a new were a new thing a few um, several well quite a while ago now, but but they've really become very popular. And one of the things that we're going to do once we all can get back together, as as we were saying before before we started, you know, it's nice to be at the Linnaean Society in Burlington House, but it's also really nice to have these lectures online. So all of our lunchtime lectures in the future will be online so that you'll be able to join them from your desk wherever you are. And I think that'll that will well, that will bring the fun things that happen in these lectures um, much to many more people. Those of you who aren't fellows of the Linnaean Society, the Linnaean Society is a charity that was founded in 1788 devoted to the study of natural history in all its branches, which means nature in all of its branches. And one of the things that's great about the society is that it brings together people from academia and people from outside academia. And it's a really fantastic place to share knowledge and share experiences and share ideas for how we can um, protect nature, conserve nature and enjoy nature much more into the future. So if you aren't a fellow, please do consider becoming a fellow. Um, the forms are on our website and we're really happy to welcome people. But this. Today's lunchtime lecture, I'm really delighted to introduce Sarian Sumner, who is a friend of mine. I hope she thinks she's a friend of mine. We are, we've been, we've known each other for a very long time and she's an absolutely wonderful person. But today she's a, a professor of behavioral ecology at the University College London. And her research focuses on the ecology, evolution and behavior of insects, especially social wasps. She also has a big part of her, of her impact is in actually having, getting people to think about wasps in ways that aren't frightening. So to change that social perception of wasps. And I'd like to just introduce that lovely hashtag wasp love. Hashtag wasp love is something that everybody should put when they, when they tweet about wasps. Today's, today's lecture is going to be about wasps and their ecosystem services. And social wasps are often stigmatized because they, they do sting us, but they're actually nature's natural pest controllers. And, and Sarian today will give an overview about the ecosystem services provided by these insects. And I hope that by the end of this lecture, you will think about wasps in the same way that you think about bees. So over to you, Sarian, let's have some wasp love. Thank you so much, Sandy. A lovely introduction and um, a thank you to the Linnaean Society for inviting me to talk about the ecosystem services of wasps. And I'm very excited about this topic, so I hope um, I hope I can contain myself. It's really bizarre sitting in a seat giving these talks about wasp love. I like to leap around the place and share my passion. So here we go from the computer screen. So when I uh, tell strangers what I do for a living, I pretty much get one response. And that response is, my computer can work, why wasps? Why on earth do you study wasps? And why would anyway, anyone put themselves voluntarily in a position of close proximity to these horrible creatures? And I have to confess that 20 years ago or 20 odd years ago, when I first started working on wasps, I felt the same way as you do. I didn't like wasps very much at all, but I soon got over my fear um, because I found myself during my PhD days, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but here's me sitting in a culvert under a uh, road in the rainforest of Malaysia. And this is where I spent most of my PhD. Um, above me, you'll see many hundreds of little brown sticks sticking down from the ceiling. Each one of these is a wasp nest. And on these uh, nests, you'll see some little br dark brown blobs. These are wasps, just like this picture in the middle here. Um, and each of these brown sticks, each of these nests is a family group. And I was sitting under these bridges, studying the social life of these insects because they give us a snapshot into the evolution of the origins of sociality. And although I hated wasps, I loved the questions and I got totally fascinated and drawn into trying to understand these incredible, pretty understudied actually insects. And then over the last 20 years or so, uh, my love of uh, social wasps in particular has taken me on a, on a whirlwind tour around the world where I've studied uh, various uh, insects, which including these enormous 
uh, polistes uh, wasps that we found in, in Latin America. And I've even stuck radio tags on wasps to learn more about their behavior. And, and in, in my uh, journey of discovery from wasp skepticism to wasp love, I've learned that I also need to share it with you people, general the, the general public. Um, and here's a picture of me. I often do this. I like to dress up in inflatable bee suits or wasp suits, if you like, and uh, share the love of, of wasps with the public. And that's partly what I'm here today doing with you. So why do I feel I need to do this? Well, it's <laughs> I'm sure you'll agree with me. People generally hate wasps. Um, a few years ago, a fabulous undergraduate student, Georgia Law at UCL, and my colleague Alessandra Cini and I got together and uh, put together a survey of people, of the public, over 700 people, asking them what they thought of wasps and um, bees, actually, to compare the two. And this summarises how people feel about wasps. We asked them to give us some words that summed up what they thought about wasps. And the size of the word indicates the number of people who chose that word to describe that insect. And as you can see, there is an overwhelming word that is used by the general public to describe wasps, and that's their sting. These poor insects, they are depicted as the gangsters of the insect world. They're out to get us because they're just there to sting us. There is no point to wasps. Now, this wasp hatred is not a new thing. In fact, it's ancient. Uh, in at least three books of the Bible, God sends the hornets or wasps to punish his people. And Aristotle, who of course was the first published uh, entomologist, talks about how hornets and wasps are devoid of the extraordinary features which characterize bees. They have nothing divine about them as the bees have. And actually it's this comparison with bees which really brings it home as to how much we misunderstand wasps. Because of course bees sting and yet we put up with that. We don't hate bees, we love bees because we understand what they do. So in this same survey of the public with Georgia and Ali, we also asked people uh, to tell us how, how, they, how useful they thought bees and wasps are in doing two key ecosystem services for us. And of course, if I were to be in person, I'd be asking for a show of hands of who thinks bees are really important for pollination. You'd all put your hands up. And indeed, this is exactly what people did on this online survey. Over 700 members of the public put their hands up and rated bees as being very useful, ranked very highly on this scale, um, as opposed to zero, which means uh, not useful at all. And here's the bees here. So the public have a really good understanding of uh, the fact that bees are important pollinators. When they were asked to rate wasps for their usefulness in pollination, they really had no idea at all. It was just kind of a, a random select of a number on a scale. Now, wasps, as Sandy said in her introduction, are pest controllers. They are predators. They eat insects around us and they regulate the insect populations. So if the public understand the value of wasps, then we would expect a figure for predation to the wasps to look like this. We'd expect the, the public to rate the usefulness of wasps in predation as very high. Sadly, this is not the case. These are the results for how useful people think wasps are for predation. Um, it is reassuring that they don't think that bees predate, so we understand the public do understand what predation means, but if they had understood that wasps were important for predation, then this bar here would have looked exactly like this bar here for the bees. So people don't know why wasps are important. We have a problem here. If I'm gonna succeed in my, my mission of wasp evangelism, to turn everybody into as big a wasp lovers as I am, then we need to do something about it. We need to provide you with a reason to love wasps. Now, in order to get humans to appreciate the outside world, the, the natural environment, we have to give you a reason to value it. And that value has to be something that impacts on you personally. And so luckily we have this framework in existence already in the con concept of ecosystem services. And this is a term we use to describe uh, all sorts of facets of the natural world and how they support uh, the quality of human life, either directly or indirectly. 
And of course, you know about the ecosystem service of bees. The, that service is pollination. Um, and so actually we have very little understanding of um, the value of the types of ecosystem services that wasps provide us with. So um, Ryan Brock, who is a master's student with me a few years ago, and again, my colleague Ali Chini, we got together and we did an, a, a, a really exhausting, exhaustive review of the literature of over 500 papers to gather any evidence we could for the types of services that wasps provide to us and how they enhance indirectly or directly the quality of our lives and these can be broadly divided up into these different types of services so regulating services are how insects help main, uh, help regulate the ecosystem supporting and how they support the system cultural services are things that are very much about us and what we benefit from them and provisioning services in terms of the nutrition either for the ecosystems or for ourselves so I'm now going to give you a little whirlwind tour of the evidence base that Ryan, Ali and I were able to gather um, on these topics. And this is very exciting for me because this paper has been a long time coming and it's going to be coming out in biological reviews in the next week. So this is hot off the press stuff. OK, so let's start with regulating services. And as Sandy said, wasps are nature's pest controllers. The wasps, we're talking about the hunting wasps here, so these are the wasps that go out and hunt insects and they'll bring it back to their nest and feed to their brood if they're a social wasp or if they're one of the 30 odd thousand species of solitary wasps, solitary hunting wasps, they'll catch that prey, they'll bring it back to an underground burrow, paralyzed, and they'll lay their egg on it and then that egg will eat that prey, live on that living larder um, until it's fully developed. So whether it's social or solitary wasps, the hunting nature of wasps is their bread and butter. And by doing what they need to do to raise their own offspring, they're actually doing enormous service to natural and farmed ecosystems. They are eating the aphids and the caterpillars that are in your gardens. They eat spiders, which perhaps you hate even more than wasps, perhaps, and the more unusual insects like this is a weevil here. They are, eat a phenomenal array of, uh, of prey. Now we've known this anecdotally for a long time, but in our review we were able to pull this all together into some predation networks and this is what we've got here. So we've divided them up into solitary wasps um, and social wasps. Now the social wasps of course are the ones that you think of as a wasp. So the Vespinae includes the yellow jacket wasps, which are the wasps that bother you at your picnics um, in the summer. And, um, and these, and in fact, those common wasps that you find the biggest pest of all are incredibly important in ecosystems because they are prey generalists. And this figure here will show you that they prey on at least 15 different orders of other insects. So that's a lot of populations of other potential pests that they are keeping at bay. They're keeping those populations regulated. And in fact, this tends to be a general feature of the social wasps we found, that they are, of all the data that we could gather, they appear to be generalists. They eat a wide diversity of prey. And that makes them really useful in ecosystems because they're likely to be just creaming off the most abundant of the populations. Solitary wasps, on the other hand, are, um, appear to be prey specialists. Um, so on the right hand side, or sorry, on the left hand side here, these red dots here are the different families of the uh, solitary wasps. And then on the right hand side in blue are the prey. And just to take an example, the Pompilidae are known as the spider hunting wasps. And indeed, on the literature we, that we could um, gather on their, the evidence of them predating on different insects, they were all the Araninae, which are the um, spiders. So many of these solitary uh, wasps are specialists in particular types of prey. But collectively, these solitary wasps are doing an enormously valuable job in being, as a generalist group, in predating a wide diversity of prey. So both the solitary and the social wasps are incredibly important as those pest controllers in our ecosystems. Now, remember this figure that I showed you a few minutes ago? This is what the, pe what the public think about the value of wasps as pollinators. They really couldn't decide. People gave them all sorts of scores. They de people just don't understand that wasps could in any way be pollinators. So what does the literature have to tell us about this? So by gathering evidence of wasps on flowers, 
um, Ryan and uh, Ali and I were able to put together this pollination network. So in white, they are here. We've got the uh, the wasp uh, subfamilies or families, and in the coloured boxes, they are all the different plant families. And I have to confess, I don't know what these are. We have to get Sandy to have a look at this later. There is, but what I can tell you is that there's a huge array of plant families which wasps are known to have relationships with. Now you might be thinking, well, hang on a minute. You've just told us that wasps are hunters. What have they got to do with flowers? They're not interested in flowers. They're not collecting pollen or, anything, or nectar for their, to feed their brood like bees do. And you're right, they're not doing that. But it's the, ad, the adult wasps that you see flying around, they are actually vegetarians. They will catch the prey and bring it back to their nest and feed to their larvae. And it's the larva, larvae that are the carnivores. The adult wasps themselves are actually um, vegetarians and they need to get sugar from somewhere. So it is uh, so they visit flowers to get sugar. But of course, if your if your picnic happens to be nearby, they'll also go for your picnic to get that sugar. Um, so we gathered uh, information on wasp plant interactions. And of course, we can't be sure that those wasps are properly pollinating those flowers. But the fact that they visit them means that they have the potential to pollinate them. And this was certainly the case for the Vespidae, which includes the social wasps. Um, these are examples here. Well, these are all the different plant families that what these wasps have been found visiting. So you can already see the potential impact that these wasps have as pollinators. On the far side here, you'll see that uh, well, these are the solitary wasp uh, family. And they to be much less generalist. They seem to be focusing very much more on a specific uh, or a small number of plant uh, plant families. And if you look at these here, the thinidae, these are actually a specialist group of wasps, which have a, a relationship with the orchids, um, a, a beautiful example of co-evolution where the orchids are 100% reliant on these wasps for pollination. And they've evolved a whole array of different ways to deceive these wasps into visiting them such that they get pollinated. So they do things like mimicking the look of a female or mimicking the smell of a plant that's being attacked by, um, by caterpillars such that the wasps will be attracted in and come and um, uh, be pollinated by them. So I think the world of wasps pollinators is massively underexplored, but a super exciting area of research that I really hope that uh, we'll learn a lot more about in the future. Um, but we can be sure at this point that wasps are, are both generalist and specialist pollinators. Um, and we found that they have relationships with uh, almost 800 different species of plants across over 100 plant families. And that are examples of obligate uh, pollinators whereby the plant is totally reliant on those wasps. Okay, so pollination and predation are examples of regulating services. Let's have a look at some of the other ways in which wasps uh, provide us with ecosystem uh, support. And this is through the supporting, this form of supporting service. Um, and this, uh, wasps actually are really useful for uh, seed dispersal. And this might surprise you because you will know that of course uh, birds are really useful for seed dispersal and even ants are renowned for being important for dispersing seeds. But in the literature, we found uh, 12 different social wasp species, which were now known to um, disperse seeds. There's a lovely picture here uh, of, a, of a vesper of a hornet um, collecting a seed. Um, and the over 10, well, 10 different plant species benefited from this. And in this case of this particular hornet, it appears, this is Vespa velutina, the yellow-legged um, Asian hornet, which is an invasive species in, in parts of Europe, um, is thought to be the primary disperser for this particular plant here. And it disperses these seeds over 100 metres, and the seed dispersing services are thought to be complementary to the well known uh, uh, service performed by ants and myrmecocori. Uh, wasps are also provide us with cultural services. Uh, so here are some of the ways in which they benefit us to, so culturally and particularly focusing in on their role as biological indicators. So some species, um, if they're present, tells us that those habitats are really degraded. 
um, the other other types of species will tell us about the diversity of the plant life in that area. So Polybia and Pseudopolybia are species of social wasps that we find in, um, in South America. Um, what's lovely about wasps, and you'll know this yourself if you've seen uh, yellow jacket wasps in your garden or polistes if you live in warmer parts of the world, is that they have this melanization, this black colouring on them, these different markings. And scientists have found that the, um, the level of, of the, break, the, the, break, the broken upness of the markings on these wasps is influenced by the level of environmental contaminants, particularly heavy metals. And so wasps like these polistes and these uh, vespine wasps may be useful environmental indicators of contaminants in the environment. Because don't forget that those wasps are predating on insects, which will be in contact, contact with soil, with plants, um, and where, where they will be acquiring, they will be accumulating those heavy metals, which then the wasps go on to hunt and to feed to their larvae. Um, and another exciting area of research is something that we're dabbling in, which is the role of wasps as a bio biodiversity monitoring tool. So here's a larva, a big fat larva of a Vespula wasp, and inside there's a black line and that's the gut. And here we've ripped out the gut of another larva. And the wonderful thing about these social wasps is that the uh, contents of their guts um, remain so, it's, it contains everything that they've been fed for their entire larval life. So you can take out their gut and sequence, DNA sequence, the contents of it. And that will tell us about the uh, diversity of the prey that they have eaten. So this could be a really useful uh, tool for monitoring biodiversity. OK, the final way in which uh, wasps uh, provide us with ecosystem services is through their yumminess. And you might be a bit surprised about this, but they are two, over two million people around the world absolutely go crazy for eating insects. Um, I actually quite like eating insects myself. They're quite yummy, um, especially if fried up with a little bit of soy sauce. Uh, wasps represent almost 5% of the insects that are consumed around the world. Um, and in Japan, in particular, they go crazy for wasps. Um, they make these lovely cookies. With these, these are actually adult wasps in here, but it's mostly the larva that are the really valuable source for human nutrition. Um, and a wasp nest can sell for $100 a kilogram in, in a market in, in Japan. So there's a huge demand there. So why? why? Why do these people go crazy for wasp larvae? What is it about them? Well, just like all the other insects that people eat around the world, Eating insects is an incredibly sustainable source of protein. They're very high in protein, low in fat, and they're much, much more efficient for producing protein than any other kind of, <clears throat> any other kind of livestock. Um, so for example, they are 12 times more efficient uh, for producing per gram of protein than beef are, for example. And it's because of this high feed to product conversion that uh, they are such a popular an important source of nutrition. And I think, you know, the, particularly in Asia where people eat insects on a regular basis, they are onto a winner there. And, and those of us who, who don't currently um, add a sprinkle of, of insects into our dishes should perhaps be taking that a little bit more seriously. Um, the other kinds of provisioning services that wasps offer us are those in the medicinal department. Um, so the nests of wasps, this is a potter wasp here with a, with a lovely uh, uh, clay nest that she's built. Um, these, they enrich by, by uh, collecting clay, they mix it with saliva, and in doing so they add minerals into the clay um, and also antibiotics but because of course they're going to lay their brood in there and their offspring is going to develop sealed up inside this clay home and so they have to make sure it stays nice and clean and that's why they add antibiotics in there and in fact people in rural Africa will often be um, particularly pregnant women and children will eat the nests of some of these uh, uh, these wasps because they are rich in um, all the kinds of uh, essential minerals that you would go to the chemist to buy if you were pregnant so zinc and iron and things like that um, another source of medicine is, of course, the venom, the, the very thing that we hate wasps for, 
um, the venom is an incredibly potent source of a, of, it's, it's a pharmacy, it's a, it's a flying pharmacy basically, um, and uh, very rich in antibiotics. And this makes sense actually, especially for the solitary wasps, which when they sting their prey, they sting a caterpillar to paralyze it and preserve it. And then they bury it underground often, lay an egg on it, and they will leave that. That's all, that's all the parental care that goes on. So they have to be sure that that living larder stays, uh, stays free. And so to do this, they've evolved a whole cocktail of antibiotics, which they will inject into the caterpillar to keep it fresh for its uh, developing baby. Um, and then finally, uh, an exciting area of research, which has only, um, only very recently come to light, is the potential for using the components of venom, so mastopyrins, in cancer treatment, because these are known, these are peptides which are known to uh, appear to attack and kill cancer cells um, and will not attack uh, um, uh, healthy cells. So that's a really exciting area of WASP research. Okay, so I've given you a little bit of a whirlwind tour of how these ecosystem services are provided by these WASPs, with the hunting WASPs, in terms of their regulating services, their supporting services, and their cultural and their provisioning services. And you can read more about that in more detail in our review when it comes out. In a, in a week or so. But the critical question is how can, well, how can we make use of this? How can we capitalize on this amazing services that these wasps provide us with? How can we harness their ecosystem services? Well, one obvious place to start is to think about how we can use social wasps as biocontrol agents. Now, you know about biocontrol. They are, these are natural enemies that we use in agriculture to keep uh, pest populations of insects at, at bay. And of course, the parasitoid wasps are really well established as biocontrol agents. These are tiny little wasps that lay their eggs inside um, the prey and they will um, uh, they're farmed actually uh, in, in factories and they can release them into fields of maize like this one here and they will very, they're very effective at keeping um, caterpillar pests at bay. Um, but, but in order to farm your own parasitoid wasps you have to have access to a big factory that produces them all year round so they're not really something for every person to be able to, to make, make use of and so for example if you want to make use of wasps in your back garden to keep your cabbages free of, of caterpillars a parasitoid wasps are not going to be something that you're going to be able to access. So I'm really excited about the idea that we could be looking more to the social wasps and exploiting them for their, their, their services as, as natural enemies of pests. And the reason why social wasps could be so important, so useful, is several reasons. Well, firstly, they have very large colonizers, so there are many hundreds or even thousands of hunters. Um, they're generalists, as I've just shown you, they eat a wide diversity of prey. So it doesn't matter what the pest is in your garden or in your agricultural field, it's probable that those social wasps will be quite happy eating them for you. They're central place foragers, which means they always come back to the same place, which of course is their nest. So you always know that if you've got a nest here, they'll be going a certain distance to uh, and, and removing the insects in, in that area. And they have this kind of peculiar behavior where they appear to fixate on a good prey. So it's like, once you find a really good pastry shop, you keep going back there for those good croissants. Wasps are just the same. If they find a really nice patch of caterpillars in a field, they will keep going back there because they know it's a good return. And of course, by eating caterpillars and flies, they have the potential to be uh, keeping some of the key ecosystem, uh, key economic pests at bay, which of course are caterpillars and flies. Now, this idea is not new. It's been kicking around, particularly in the natural history literature for uh, well, a few hundred years, really. Um, Edward, Edward Omerod, who is a, a British naturalist in the 1800s, and his fabulous book, it's a great read, I recommend it, uh, British Social Wasps, um, he says that the practical result of destroying all the wasps on Sir Brisbane's estate was that in two years' time, the place was infested, like Egypt, with a plague of flies. So what he's telling us is that this, this guy, Sir Brisbane, had all the wasps removed because they were pesky and annoying them. But actually then his whole estate had lots of, had, was infested with lots of flies, which really brings it home to us, the potential for wasps, uh, for wasps as these biocontrol agents. But despite um, 
uh, Omrod's uh, ideas back in the 1800s, we, uh, it's surprising how very little research has been done into using social wasps for biocontrol. Um, and so together with some colleagues, uh, Odea and uh, Fabio in Brazil a couple of years ago, and with Robin, um, who was a postdoc in my lab, we set out to try and gather a little bit of evidence, or at least to test the hypothesis, that these social wasps could be useful in keeping the populations of key economic pests at bay. Um, we chose the uh, beautifully named Polistes Satan, uh, which is the Brazilian farmer's friend, uh, a lovely sleek wasp. It's pretty big and scary looking, but once you learn how to approach it, um, it's, it's a really rather lovely and beautiful insect to work with. Um, and using these insects, we uh, gave them uh, maize plants, which were infected with the fall army worm, which is a key economic pest, which causes billions of dollars of, of crop uh, losses every year throughout the world. Um, and we exposed some of the plants to the wasps, so we allowed them to the wasps to access the plants, and we protected the other plants from the wasps, so the wasps couldn't actually access them. And we found that uh, the plants where the wasps were able to uh, access them, so the wasp exposed plants, had significantly less damage on their plants, on the plant leaves, and also lower uh, populations, so fewer pests on the plants compared to those plants where we'd excluded the wasps from. So this was a nice uh, beginning of an evidence base that was these social wasps really could be effective as biocontrol agents. But our experiment was conducted inside this greenhouse here. And what we really need to do is to take this out to the field. And we're starting to think about this, particularly in its um, appl application in uh, the developing uh, countries, uh, particularly in those in subtropical and tropical regions where the wasps are, are really abundant. There's a huge diversity of social wasps. And as you can see here in this picture, the wasps just nest on buildings in pretty dense aggregations. They like to nest in these sort of aggregations altogether, which makes them really amenable to being um, to setting up sort of vespiaries, so groups of wasp nests together on the edges of plantations like this, uh, where they could access the fields and eat the prey. Um, the great thing about wasps is that they appear to be pretty, at least solid, uh, social wasps appear to be pretty resilient to anthropogenic disturbance. They like nesting in places in, in abandoned buildings, for example, um, and also in the tropic, tropical areas where there's um, a very high diversity of species, you're likely to be able to find a wasp species that matches the, the life cycle of the prey species of interest. Um, and so there's an enormous potential there to choose the right pest controller for your pest. The other brilliant thing, the other uh, for the potential of social wasps is biocontrol is that they're very low in cost. In fact, they're free. They're on buildings everywhere. They're under trees everywhere. Um, wasps are everywhere if you care to look. Working with wasps requires very little skill and training. Um, you might be surprised to hear that, but it doesn't really, uh, it's, you can very quickly train people up to work with them safely. And this makes them potentially very useful for small scale subsistence farms. Um, in these developing countries. And of course, they're environmentally sustainable. If we can swap pesticides for wasps as our biocontrol agents to keep pests at bay and assure our food security, then I think we're on to a winner. So I've just given you one example of how we could potentially harness the one of the many ecosystem services that wasps provide us with. And, um, but I think the, uh, the, the take home message here is that there are so many ways in which we could benefit from wasps if we only cared to look. So that's it from me. I just want to thank the, uh, the people who've contributed to the work that I've talked about in this talk. So the ecosystem services team, so Ali and Ryan, and as I said, our paper's coming out next week and it's open access, so all will be able to read it. Um, the Why We Hate Wasps team, Georgia and Ali, um, and the biocontrol wasps team, um, the team in Brazil and Robin. And finally, uh, my kids, my poor kids, they've sat through so many uh, talks by me talking about wasps. Uh, and I think that my son a few years ago, he summed it up in only the way that any child could. Uh, wasps are like parents, helpful, but annoying. So I hope you've enjoyed that and that I've brought a little bit of wasp love into your lives. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you so much, Syrian.
That was absolutely fantastic. And I'm sure if people don't go away loving wasps more after that, then there's absolutely no hope. There have been lots of comments about what an amazing lecture and there's things that people never knew, like that wasp larvae never poo. I mean, what a fact. <laughs> Terrific. Um, we've got a few questions here. Michael asks if you could explain the diagram, you know, the diagram where you looked at the kind of wasp love, ver wasp versus bees, and explain how you get what the patterns mean. Um, yeah, so I could go back to that slide or I could just try and do it. Um, I, I, could, <laughs> I could just draw, really throw my arms around. Okay, so yeah, so on the, um, the y axis, we had um, the value, the usefulness of, uh, of that particular service. So where zero, it was on a scale that we asked people to rate the um, usefulness of uh, the insect on a scale of zero to 10, like a Likert scale. And then um, we, where, where 10 represents the most useful, you know, this is the super, you couldn't be more useful at pollination or predation. Um, and zero means you're not remotely interested, you're not remotely helpful at all. So the fact that, was it to do with pollination or predation at the question mark? Well, either one, it just how those diagrams work. Yeah, but okay, so. The width of the gray thing means if it's wide, it means lots of people answered that. Uh, yes, uh, no, uh, yes, that's right. Yes, yeah, so exactly right. So the, the well, no, I think actually it was the error bars around it um, for the, the, so people were more likely to rate bees, for example, as having a very high ecosystem service value at not at nine or ten. Um, and there were there were sorry, yes, there were many more people who said that. Yes, that's right. Yes, sorry, yeah. <laughs> I should get the figure up really. Yes, you're absolutely right. The the, the wider the scale, the more people um, who uh, would uh, rate those insects for that particular value. Yes, exactly. So the, the reason that the wasps are kind of like a big column of gray is that nobody really knew what to answer. Exactly, it always seemed random. It's like, oh, I don't really know. I'll just tick a box. Tick a box, <laughs> tick a box, tick a box any box. It just it's a bad strategy. Yeah. Oh, great, so hopefully that's answered Michael's question. And then when he goes back to see the kind of recording, he can, um, he can have a look. So um, somebody else has asked that um, if, one, if adult wasps are vegetarian, and this is actually a really important question for us to answer, is if, you, if adult wasps are vegetarian, why do they sting humans? <laughs> well, they only sting humans if you get in their way. Um, I mean, they're-, they're uh, Right, so if you go up to their nest, they would do what any good um, carer would do, defend their offspring, defend the, the, the young, the youngsters, they're defending their prey, their, their, their brood. Um, but you can, you know, they also can become habituated to you. So the way that we, when we study our wasps in the, in the, in the field, we find that when we first, we always wear bee hats, by the way, just to be sure that we don't get stung. Um, but we'll, at the start of the season, studying the insects, they do tend to, you know, you can see them looking at you. <gasps> <laughs> and they, they know they can say got incredible visual uh, capacity wasp but they have mm -hmm. to, to be good hunters and they can see you they can see you totally um and they will learn they might attack you to start off with but then they will learn that you're no threat to them and we can even go as far as uh, with a pair of forceps going up to the nest and taking off a single wasp with forceps without the others really being bothered at all. So you can really habituate these insects to you. The times when you get stung are when you've accidentally uh, stumbled on a nest and they're just defending their nest. Um, or if you're, you know, if you're having a picnic outside or you're in a beer garden and there's wasps that come to your, your, your food, then um, if you just leave them alone and just watch where they go, they'll probably, they're not interested in you. They're interested in your ham sandwich uh, if they're going for, because they'll get, that's a source of protein as well um, for their brew, which they'll feed to their brood or your sugary jam or something like that. They're not actually interested in you until you start swiping. And once you start going like this, then you're a threat and that's when you're most likely to get stung. Yeah, so that's so that's a, that's a that's a really important thing to realize is they're they're not stinging you because they dislike you. They're stinging you because they feel threatened. Exactly. Um, so people have also a couple of people have asked about um, uh, wasps as vectors of disease. So are they are they disease vectors in any kind of way? Well, right. You're reaching the uh, end of my knowledge on that. I'm afraid. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Well, then if that's fine, we can we yeah. can 
find out. That's a great question, though. I will I'll, I'll look it up. <laughs> and um, Jeanette's asked if there are particular species of plants that, that she could plant to attract wasps to the garden. I'm so pleased you asked that. I, I think that the idea of wasp flowers is a whole new world that we've completely overlooked. And, and in fact, I'm doing exactly that this summer. I'm, I'm going to, I'm learning a lot about plants, Sandy, you'll be very impressed with me. Yay. And I, I'm, I'm trying to get plants because from our, from our data set, we were able to pick out um, plants that are, are, are known to have lots of records of wasps visiting them. Um, so ivy is really good it's a, when it's flowering. Um, uh, uh, pot, uh, pot marigold is supposed to be really good as well. Mm -hmm. um, I can't remember off the top of my head, but you can look in our paper. There's a whole range of different flowers um, that have had records of wasps on them. And I think if we looked a bit harder, we would see a lot more of this. So this time of year, if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, is a brilliant time of year to start looking at this. Um, and we, because the queen wasps are just coming out of hibernation and they form a nest uh, the, the, the Vespula wasps, they'll form a nest um, solitarily on their own, they build their nest themselves. So they are like a solitary wasp at that point. So they have to do all the provisioning and all the cell building and they'll be going out and hunting, but they'll also be going to flowers to get sugar. Because until their larvae are big enough, they're not going to be getting the sugary reward that larvae give to the adult wasps. So when the, when the colony is big and there's lots of big juicy larvae there and they're being provisioned by the adults, um, in return for having a, a lovely fly, <laughs> um, the larvae will produce um, a, a secretion that the, that the adult wasp will then take. And that's we, we think has this um, nutritional value for the wasps. And so at the very early, early spring, like now, the, uh, the queen wasps have no other source of, of sugar. They have to go and visit plants. They have to go and visit those flowers to get the sugar that they need to have energy. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why we get again at the end of the season um, in temperate climates at the end of the season when wasps start visiting your pet your picnics more you'll probably find that they're also visiting plants more but we have no data but I think they'll be visiting plants more then because they also one of the reasons they bother you at your picnics is because there are fewer larvae in the nest by then because they started pupating and once they've pupated they seal over their caps their, their, their pupil caps they don't need feeding anymore and so the wasps aren't getting the, um, the sugary secretions from the larvae. So somebody's put in the chat, and I think this is right, is that shallow flowers are particularly important because wasps don't have long tongues like some bees do. Some bees yeah. don't have long tongues, but other bees don't. And exactly. some flies. So a lot of, so of the shallow, shallow flowers are actually pollinated by flies or wasps, which, yeah. is, which, is, which is really, really great. Um, so now wait a minute there was another there was another question in here about um oh how many so somebody's asked how many times were you stung when you were doing your research <laughs> actually Siri doesn't get stung she's amazing she can walk up walk up to these wasps nests and they look at her and go we know she loves us we're not gonna bother her <laughs> i um i think i can be safe to say that i have been stung less than 20 times in my entire wasping career and the reason for that is that I am very careful. Um, I was, so I was stung quite badly early on in my wasping life um, on my head and I blew up like elephant woman. <laughs> and and I, that was the first time I'd really reacted badly. And I, it was a bit of a wake up call. I hadn't worn, I wasn't wearing my bee hat. I was sloppy and careless. And that was just a kind of wake up call. I thought, okay, hang on a minute. I don't want to become really allergic to these guys because I want to spend my life studying them. And actually there are many other wasp researchers in the world who are highly allergic to wasps for exactly that reason. So I've gone out of my way to try not to get stung. And obviously I do get stung a, a little bit still, but I, I take all precautions. So I, I have to say that in a, I think within one, yeah, my a recently finished PhD student, I think he, he uh, acknowledges in his, uh, his thesis acknowledgement the 186 wasps that had stung him. And that's just in three years. <laughs> so if you want to get stung, go crazy, but you don't have to get stung to study wasps. So there's a question from, a, it says a dumb question from a botanist, but in my view, no questions are ever dumb. Is if the sting is a modified ovipositor, do queens, do, do queens sting as well? 
Yes, yes, yes. So, um, so yes. So only females have stings um, because they're modified ovipositors. Um, queens do sting. Uh, they're less inclined to sting you, I have to say, because they're not. They're doing less of the defending. They're mostly at home. Um, but the, uh, I guess, to clear up the question for you, workers can lay eggs. So they can't mate, but they can lay eggs. So both all the females, the queens and the workers, they both have stings and they can both lay eggs. Um, and so they still have, they still retain all of the same machinery that um, that the queen queen has, the reproductive queen has. Great. So somebody's also asked, um, Gavin's asked, is the Asian hornet as much of a threat to UK biodiversity as beekeepers make out, or are they just trying to protect their colonies as an investment? Uh, it's a really good question. I think the research into, so the yellow-legged Asian hornet, I think they're referring to, which is Vespa velutina, not the giant Asian hornet, um, Mandarina, which is invading the US. And um, the yellow-legged Asian hornet is the one that's a threat here. And it has it been incredibly successful in Europe, in, um, in France, in Italy, and those areas where it is uh, the way that it's because of its behavior, it's very effective at raiding um, honeybee colonies, hon honeybee hives, um, because it does this hawking behavior. They sort of hang up, they're so clever ones. They, they hang around at the hive entrance and then they all pounce on, wor on workers. And our native European hornets don't do that. Um, and so I think the it's much more obvious that these hornets are predating on honeybees and the beekeepers are noticing that. Mm -hmm. But um, Vespa velutina is like is a generalist, right? It's a generalist hunter. It's not just hunting Apis mellifera. Um, and so I would be more concerned about the native bees, not the honeybee. So all the solitary bees on the, and the hoverflies. And I think we, we shouldn't be so fixated on the problem with honeybees because actually there isn't a honey, there's no problem with honeybees. Honeybees are fine. Uh, you know, the beekeeping industry is, it will keep those, uh, keep those going. What we need to look out for are the species that aren't being so well looked after. And those are the species which will be as likely to be the prey of the uh, invasive hornet as the honeybees. Yeah, that's a uh, yeah. I hadn't I hadn't realized that that's what they did. That they ganged up on them as they were entering in. That's really, really fascinating. Um, there, somebody's pasted something in the chat saying something about insects that can make you sick. So if wasps can make you sick, what can you do to treat or prevent it? And I think this might be, I I, I don't know, but I. I, th I think making you sick might mean an allergic reaction. Oh, okay. What can you do about allergic reactions to wasp stings. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a question for a medic. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's <laughs> definitely, a question, definitely a question for a medic. I was always told to put something different on wasp stings than on bee stings. Oh, it's all mythology. I remember yeah. which way around it goes, so I never do it yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> I think you meant to. So I had a field assistant in Panama once. Uh, she got stung and she immediately said, give me your water bottle. And she grabbed my water bottle. We were in the middle of nowhere um, in, in, the, in the field. She poured out my water and then she disappeared off into the bushes to pee in the, pee in the bottle so she could pour the pee on her that's wasp that's like, that's I don't think that's gonna work. <laughs> not wasps, that's serious. Um, yeah. so, so somebody, so somebody um, one of the things I wanted to say, um, that, that you didn't say is we've been talking a lot about female wasps because what we're talking about when we talk about wasps that sting is we're always talking about females. And wasps, of course, have males as well. And all of those wasps that are pollinating the, the thionine wasps in Australia that, that pollinate yeah. all of those orchids are male wasps. Correct. Because they think that the orchid is the female wasp and they're trying to mate with it. So, so, so the interesting thing about wasps as pollinators for me is it's both males and female wasps, um, which are acting as pollinators in the, yeah. in the ecosystem. Whereas the predators, it's much more the females who are provisioning the nest, isn't it? Absolutely right. Yeah, and I think you know, we we don't. I mean, we don't know that much about male, uh, particularly the males. So well, males of the social or the solitary wasps, really, because they are they are well in from in the social insect world, males are regarded as useless 
and they are merely flying sperm. <laughs> I love saying that. <laughs> um, at this probably, the story is a lot more complicated than that because they do do lots of other things. Um, but yes, it ultimately, uh, the males in a social wasp colony are produced at the end of the colony cycle. <clears throat> and uh, they are a little bit of a drain on resources because they're basically hanging out in the colony, but they need feeding. Um, and so they will be getting some of that nutritional uh, fluid from the from the larvae, but but males will also have to go out and visit flowers to get the sugar that they need to keep themselves in healthy mating mating uh, condition. condition. <laughs> yes, it's a really good point. Yeah, yeah. So so um, so somebody's asked asked about the learning about about your your exact your kind of your experience of the wasps learning about you is do you mentioned vision that they they would learn about you from seeing you but they do do, do they do, do can they use smell as well do they do they have olfactory yes okay. yeah so we don't know a huge amount about how wasps well what wasp sensory systems but um <clears throat> we know that they must have really good vision because the way that they hunt so they will I argue, I mean, bees have incredible vision as well, and they see ultraviolet, you know, they see iridescence in flowers and, and, that, and, 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 and that's phenomenal. But we don't know anything about wasps in that respect. But what we do know is that they have to hunt prey that are often scuttling through the undergrowth. And if you ever watch a wasp doing it, it's incredible. And they, you know, they, they really must be having a, a very good visual cues there. Mm -hmm. but, but olfactory signals are also really important. Um, and in fact, the solitary wasps are, are probably where this is most exciting to look at because if you, so many of the, the prey of a solitary wasp will be hidden under bark or in the ground. And uh, the solitary wasp will, if you see a solitary wasp going on the ground, she'll often be drumming her antennae on the ground. And her antennae are basically her, it's her nose, it's her smelling apparatus. And she'll be detecting um, volatiles, uh, so, so smells basically, airborne smells, um, chemicals in the air, volatiles released by the unsuspecting prey um, that then she will then be honing in on. But this is quite an un unexplored area. I mean, there is, there is a little bit of research on it, but it's so much more to learn. There's, 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 there's a lot to learn. Um, uh, very, various people have, have, um, have asked various kinds of things and there's, uh, we're almost done with the questions and there's 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 a there's one question about the kind of about the agricultural importance um romald has asked if there have been many studies on the cost benefit analysis of introducing wasps to farms and there's another related question i'm going to kind of riddle them together mm -hmm. is that is the cost benefit analysis but also um having wasps on farms is that a risk if you introduce something that's not native that could it become invasive or do you, are you talking about using native wasps in yeah. all? So I'm talking about native wasps, and that, and in fact, the the introducing of a of a non-native species is exactly the problem that they've had with the parasitic wasps, um, because they are generally introduced species, mm -hmm. and uh, the problem with an introduced species is that you don't you can't always predict what it's going to do in a new environment, and we know that social wasps are incredibly successful as invasive species. Um, you just have to look at the yellow jackets that we've imported to New Zealand and Australia and Argentina and <laughs> the dreadful things that they're doing there. Um, so yes, I, I, we're not encouraging the importation of um, non-native species. And, and that's why I really think that the potential for using social wasps is very much um, to do with uh, capitalizing on what you've got. And in, the, in, in tropical and subtropical areas, there's such a huge diversity of social wasps that there is always a social wasp on your doorstep. What we don't know is how much uh, the different uh, species or genera of wasps uh, differ in their, uh, their efficiency as pest controllers. And we also don't know how efficient these wasps could, would be are in, you know, in a natural environment where there's other predators around. Um, and we don't quite, you know, the, the experiments that we've done so far have all been in controlled conditions. Um, we don't know how effective they're going to be in the field. But one of the great things about these social wasps is that they're quite easy to relocate. So you can just ziplock, which is every field biologist's perfect <laughs> bit of equipment. You can use a ziplock to just simply remove an entire nest with all its inhabitants, and you can relocate it to a different place, stick it in a, you know, in a red, in a sort of a, a ready-made vespery or a building where you want to keep the wasps, um, and they will um they will. They will stay there they will you know you can get them to stay there 
um, and they'll form a new population. So I think the potential for farming, I mean, let's look at the honeybees, you know, we drive honeybees hundreds of kilometers across the US to pollinate different fields with the seasons. Um, you know, we can we can work with wasps in a similar way by relocating them and forming populations where they will be useful to us as pest controllers, but far enough away from our, our houses such that we're not going to be in danger. Yeah, so using native species all the time. Of course, honeybees across the US are not a native species. I know. <laughs> Yeah. No, so and then what about the cost benefit analysis? Have there been any studies of this cost benefit? So that's no. another open field for maybe somebody to kind of get interested yeah. in do a bit of research in particular. So that, absolutely. I mean, there's no there's so little research done. Um I think I think it's fair to say that the experiment that we did with the Brazilians is the first sort of um controlled experiment where we 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 tested that hypothesis, you know, um in, in controlled conditions. And uh, that scientists have tried to do similar things in the US actually in the 70s where they tried to do it on farms but it was inconclusive uh, results. So the, the, the right experiments haven't yet taken place in the field so we just don't have any of the basic fundamental understanding in order to conduct a cost benefit analysis but that's exactly what we, we'd love to do. It would be amazing. Yeah, so um, someone from North India, they're, they, they're from um, in Northeast India are attending, which is absolutely fantastic. And um, they've said that most of the hornets or wasps are seasonal in their region. Is there any possibility to induce or make them non-seasonal? So what, what about the seasonality of things? Well, I think you need to first ask yourself is if the wasps are seasonal, are the pests also seasonal? Because actually you only need the wasps around when the pests are around and if it's um if it's a temperate region then it's quite likely that the pests and the wasps will be concurrent anyway um but how you could how you would extend wasp i don't think you could do that i i don't think that's yeah i, I, think, I'd it'd be, I think it'd be i think it'd be quite it'd be really quite tricky yeah there's um there's lots of quite people are putting questions in the chat and in the q a which makes it very difficult to kind of um to to uh to manage but basically there's lots of lots of you know wonderful talk and people are going to want to go back and look and kind of think about it think about it a, a, a bit more but i'd be really interested um in thinking about what plants we need to put in our gardens to to increase increase wasps and see if that can can um can affect my my wasp count yeah and i think it has a lot of potential not only are you providing um habitats for wasps which is good because you're in, you're boosting the population of your local pest controllers but i also like the idea that you could have your wasp garden at the back of your garden away from where you're having your you know where your patio is and where you might have your you know your, your lunch mm -hmm. and that would that would potentially i don't know if it'll work or not but attract the wasps away from you and to those plants who knows it might work well someone's put in the chat that one of their techniques in picnics is to put a bit of food a bit away from where you're sitting and the yeah. wasps will go there instead yeah Probably. exactly yeah bait it's, it's, yeah you know, this is yeah. about sharing <laughs> yeah no exactly i think in argentina where the vespula are a really problem uh, problematic invasive species um often if you go for a picnic in argentina apparently you take a spare fish with you and you stick this fish as a kind of wasp offering <laughs> far away from where you're sitting and that'll lure in all the wasps and then you can eat your picnic in peace <laughs> And someone has put in the chat about, um, Steve's put in the chat about um, male wasps, uh, some of the solitary wasps are quite easy to pick up and you can really impress people by picking up a bee wolf. Absolutely, yeah, go for them out. We have to be sure that they're a male and sometimes males, they try and they, they mimic the behavior of a stinging female uh, when you pick them up. Um, and their claspers are sometimes quite sharp. And so you can consider, you know, when you first pick them up, you, you might initially think they're a female because they're putting these things out their abdomen and they're slightly spiky. <laughs> so you have to just be they're sure it's a clasp, oh, is it a sting? <laughs> not, quite, not quite the same. Oh, that's great. Well, Syrian, I think we're, we're sort of running, out of running out of questions. There's one last one, the one last question. Um, and you alluded to this in the very beginning of your talk, you know, about, about the, the ancient literature of wasp hate. And, um, and, and so, so Michael asks if there's any other literature that, because the ancient Greeks referred to locusts as flying serpents. Is there anything from sort of the Greek and Roman literature about wasps? Wow. Um, 
I'm not sure I know the answer to that right now, but there is, the there is certainly, really it's surprising. The more you look, the more you find um, this ingrained cultural uh, attitude, a negative attitude to wasps. Um, and it does go back um, millennia. You know, we, we have, you know, as I used the example of Aristotle and how he talks. In fact, I, I, I sort of misrepresented Aristotle. I use that lovely quote uh, to, to show that he didn't think they were as good as bees. But actually, Aristotle, um, as he did with many things in the natural world, he, he made some of the most insightful observations about wasps um, that are right, are still are largely right today. And, and actually, to be honest, our understanding of wasp biology has not progressed a lot <laughs> since what Aristotle had to say. Um, <laughs> so I think that says a lot, a lot, a lot about uh, the, the research effort that's gone into to learning about wasps. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can find evidence of, of um, sort of wasps as their kind of um, their evilness. And I think in there is some um, uh, sort of some of the other religions, they have examples of how wasps are, um, are, are yes, are, are, I can't remember, I can't remember. There are some examples, sorry, that's a really bad answer. <laughs> well, a good answer but, that there's something for someone to go and research, that's absolutely yeah. <laughs> and, it, and, and so people have said, what a great talk, provided a great understanding of wasps' role in nature, and Victoria Burton has asked the $64,000 question, is is the big wasp survey running again this year oh yes a yeah. tiny bit about the big wasp survey okay whether you're running it again all right so the big wasp survey thanks for bringing it up this is a, a citizen science project that adam hart and i co-founded um four years ago so this will be our fifth year and we asked members of the public to hang uh, wasp traps in their garden. Um, you can make, I did it, I did it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, with, which is just a, a bottle that you kind of cut the top off and uh, invert and put some beer in the bottom, hang it in your garden for um, a week at the end of the summer, and then um, send us the wasps that are in your trap. And we've been able to piece together maps of the different species distributions um, across the UK. The pandemic changed everything. Um, and it's one of these silver linings uh, that's come out of the pandemic is that we were forced, we couldn't receive wasps last year because the labs were closed. Um, and so we had a very uh, clever student who put together some lovely videos where people could identify their wasps themselves at home. We ran it on a very small scale um, just so we could check whether it works or not. And that worked out tremendously. Um, and so this year we are hoping to roll out big wasp survey again but not only do the citizen scientists put out the traps and collect the insects they're also identifying them themselves in their house at home which I think is enriching the experience for those citizen scientists I so yes but watch this space because <laughs> knowing knowing about things we had to talk about about plants last night at the society and it and and knowing about something and interacting with it sometimes makes you appreciate it more so perhaps there'll be more wasp love that comes from the big wasp survey when you do your own identification. I hope well, so. That's great. Oh, Syrian, thank you so much for that wonderful talk and for answering all those questions. And thanks to our audience as well. And um, if you want to see it again, it will be on YouTube. And the chat is full of, full of people talking about how they're going to look at their gardens and wasps in a completely new way. So you've definitely done your job here today, Syrian. Thank <laughs> you so much. Thanks for inviting me, Sandy.